Hello, everybody. My name is Regina. Um, I would like to take the opportunity today to talk about how you, as an employer, uh, can prepare yourself for a successful rehabilitation. So, today I will give you my collected experience from 20 years in 20 minutes. How about that? <laughs> uh, it can certainly be an expensive, time-consuming, frustrating, and truly challenging task to have to deal with a co-worker who's drinking too much. Uh, on top of that, the Swedish labor laws are very clear. You have to offer treatment uh, when needed. Um, right or wrong, I think that can be discussed, actually. And just to mention today, for the smaller companies, this can be a true disaster, I must say. Um, I'm not going to focus on that today, but um, instead I would like to focus on the opportunities with this Swedish model. Um, because Swedish companies can possibly contribute to decreasing, I would say, and reducing the costs and the suffering coming from alcohol addiction in this country. Uh, I will point out three important advantages with this model. We know today that 300,000 Swedes meet the criteria of addiction, alcohol dependence that is. 250,000 of them uh, do have a job to go to every day. That means they're reachable. They're out there working, working in the companies. We know where they are. Uh, second of all, secondly, the ones who still do have a job to go to don't want to lose it. Of course not. Uh, so I would say they're slightly more motivated than um, the ones without a job. And as we know, motivation is king, especially in this um, in this matter. Uh, thirdly, cut, sorry, cutting the bill is I important. You can reduce the suffering and you can reduce the costs uh, by this Swedish model. And cutting the bill is important. Uh, the Swedish companies pay today around 20 billion Swedish crowns a year um, because you know, you have a person uh, with a lot of sick leave, you have the accidents, you have the bad delivery, you have the bad quality. Did you know that a person drinking too much or drinking four to five glasses of wine a day, for example, only the day after only um, uh, perform on 75% of their capacity? A person drinking too much does this ever so often twice a week, three times, or even every day uh, during the week. Literally speaking, I would say addiction is a waste of resource in the company. So every person costs the company, drinking this much, costs the company around 150,000 Swedish crowns a year. <coughs> Nevertheless, the Swedish model, um, it's a tricky situation to deal with addiction and the responsibility is always to take action and initiate the rehabilitation is on the <coughs> shoulders of the employer. Uh, from research we know it takes employers around seven years from the first signs of too much drinking until action is taken. Seven years is a long time. Uh, we also know that drinking is listed by leaders as one of the most awkward topics to deal with, along with dismissal and bad hygiene, bad smell that is, mm -hmm. mostly. And of course it's awkward, you know, but I have during the past 20 years been working in the area of performance psychology, it's called, uh, shortly the ability to make the right decisions in trees. Uh, in tricky circumstances. I'm hired by the Swedish police, for example, working in Tienstad, Inkeby and Husby, uh, and by the CAA, um, Civil Aviation Authority, Luftfartsverket, that is, 
uh, with air traffic controllers and pilots. Um, and from working with leadership and crisis management, my experience is that when situations are um, awkward, unpleasant, or experience is lacking, it's good to, uh, you will need knowledge, you will need skills, and you will need a strategy. That's, I would say, a good package for success. So, let's start with the strategy. And keep Could you it. repeat this three? The three? Yeah. Knowledge, mm. skills, and strategy. I'm going to say that many times today, so. Okay. <laughs> um, so, the strategy. We start with the strategy. Um, I would say keep it very simple, as simple as possible. I call it levels of ambition. You know, the first time something happens, and something happens, that is, some, somebody gets, you know, strange at work, f probably from drinking. After work, maybe too many, too many drinks, or coming in late, or smelling of alcohol, or, you know, something is happening, happening and you realize that, as an employer now I'm talking, you realize that something is not really good here. Um, start a discussion, I would say. Just keep it very short. The purpose at this stage is only to make the employee understand that you, as an employer, has realized that there is a problem somewhere. And this might be my best uh, advice today, actually, because and my cheapest advice as well. Because if you do it, if you take action immediately, you might just have to do it once. If you're talking to a heavy drinker, it's probably pretty much easier to cut down on drinking than if you wait seven years and the addiction is already very established. So don't miss that chance. Take action immediately, I would say. But, um, you know, shit happens, as they say. It's not always that easy. When consequences get more severe or it happens more often, now you're realizing that, there, that things are, are getting harder to sort out. So you see more severe consequences from the drinking. You are now also ready to take even more um, action and to offer support in a, in a more outspoken way, of course. Maybe just talk about you know, assessment, going to the occupational health service, um, and doing it. Closer follow-ups also to um, to make sure things are are uh, changing, and the third level of ambition when there is nothing more to discuss, and that's when somebody's coming in drunk at work. Of course, you can't stay uh, drunk at work to any price. So then you you really have to be more. Um, um, uh, more direct in how to treat uh, the, the, the person immediately. And a pers never let a person who smell of alcohol stay in the workplace, uh, of course. So when taking action, um, I would like to say focus on the behavior. Don't talk very much about the drinking because you might get lost in the discussions about what's normal and what's not. You know, you, you can never win that kind of discussions. Talk about the consequences of the drinking instead. Because the rules are the same for this person as for everybody else at the workplace. And that's much easier to keep a straight line. Um, and you might find that you don't share the same reality. Of course not. So don't try to find consensus. There's no use in this in, in, in when you start a discussion. No consensus. Instead, you should practice not being liked, I usually say, to my, uh, when I have leadership training. You know, practice not being liked. That's a good one. Uh, that, can be, that can be a clue, really, because in dealing with this and other awkward topics, you, uh, you need to not seek um, affirmations, I would say. So exercise on this bad feeling in your stomach once when you don't feel liked, really. 
So it's obvious you don't share the same uh, the same reality. How come? I will now if explain that to you by showing you the model of change. Most of you have already seen this, I'm, I'm sure. But I'm just going to go through it because it it um, explains a lot about how the person will react. Um, so there are six stages in this model. Your employee will re react and answer according to where about in the process he or she is located. The pre-contemplation stage, where the first stage, where pre-contemplation, where ignorance is bliss. That's a wonderful state to be, to be in. You know, no problem at all, no concern whatsoever. And of course, for you as an employer, it's not that nice, but uh, the person in front of you you know, don't uh, share the same reality. Typical for this state might be that he or she shows quite a lot of irritation and hostility even, if the drinking is mentioned. Um, but moving on to contemplation stage, the second one. Um, in this stage, people recognize a problem and are contemplating a change. Not yet committed to it though. So it's like sitting on a, on a fence, not knowing what side you're getting down on. Uh, ambivalence is all about this stage. All about the pros, the pros and the cons of uh, changing, really. It can, it, can, it can last for quite a while, this, this stage. Um, and what you can do as an um, employer is really just to, to, to stay calm and demand and require the change you, you want to see in the workplace. It's nothing more you can do. Leave the rest to the therapist, I would say. Um, it can last for a long time, as I said. We, we all know how, how hard it can be to, to change training habits or eating habits. But now we're also dealing with the, mol the, the alcohol molecule, so it makes it even harder and the brain gets even more hesitant to changes. You will probably take, as an employer, you will probably take ac action in one of the two first stages. Um, and maybe the dialogue between the two of you will change. But for the time being, it's better just to practice not being liked and, and accept it the way it is. The therapist, though, will, of course, uh, tailor the interventions in purpose to facilitate a move into the next stage, the ac action stage. Um, el or, uh, sorry, the preparation stage. So in, in the preparation stage, you will see small steps towards a, uh, towards a changing in the... Uh, did I get that wrong? Yes. Yes. I did. Preparation is number three, right? Yes. So <coughs> just sw switch it, please. <laughs> yeah, I got that wrong. Um, so anyway, the preparation stage, focus in, in treatment is on supporting self-efficacy, uh, generating a planning and a plan and setting action goals. So the next stage, the fourth, will be action. So now things are starting to happen. Um, you know, they, people are, are putting their plan for change into action, are choosing new behaviors. This is quite a, an interesting stage, I would say, because um, in some cases, in most cases, I would say, you see the so the self-efficacy is really, you know, they're gaining and they are getting stronger and stronger in their new behaviors. It's a good phase for, for most people because they realize the changing isn't that very hard. Although, of course, um, <coughs> they are changing a whole <laughs> old <coughs> set of rules, I would <coughs> say, into totally new ones. New skills, as I talked about before. Um, and and also there can be quite a distressful time, as um, we have heard before today, 
during the action phase. So it's it's both wine and water, as we say in Swedish. I don't know if if it's good to use that one here. Um, A common misunderst misunderstanding, though, is that when going into rehab, you're you're in in the action stage uh, immediately, and that's totally wrong. Ni I would say 95% of the people that I meet are in the first two stages, not at all into changing, um, or very reluctant anyway. <laughs> So, and many of the programs are built around the action phase, so, so it doesn't really fit um, most of our clients, I would say. That's a problem, um, and I think that's need to, that needs to be addressed in some ways. Um, the fifth stage is the maintenance stage. So in this stage, the, the client has been able to change their behaviors mm -hmm. and has kept the, beha the new behaviors for at least six months. Um, they are committed to maintaining the new, the new behaviors. It's often a totally different person you meet at this stage, I would say. Uh, they're less defensive, more active, and in therapy, we, we talk about how to keep the positive uh, behaviors, the positive solutions, the new skills, positive, uh, positive environments, and so on. Um, but also talk, of course, about not being too um, overconfident. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's easy to get into the mood where, okay, this is going so well, I don't think I have any problems. You've heard this one before. Um, and the sixth stage, the relapse stage, can of course happen anywhere uh, in the process. Um, it's quite easy to, f to fall off the wagon. Um, it's not a huge problem, I would say. Um, especially not in, in treatment, because you get so many new, so much new information and obviously also new skills after a relapse. But a relapse is defined, of course, of re resuming, resuming the old behaviors. Um, you find new triggers, I think. You get new information. You learn new co coping skills. Uh, it's not a disaster. It's you're learning even more about yourself. And this is a lifelong lesson, of course. It's not just for people with addiction. It's for most of us. We fall off the wagon once in a while. So we have gone through the model of change to improve. I was talking about the, no the knowledge. Um, we're talking about the skills, keep it as easy as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've looked at the strategies um, that you could possibly follow. I'm not going to talk about, or m maybe I am. Do I have time to talk about? No. no. Five so I'm going to jump into conclusions. That's. That's the wrong way to say it, but I'm going to do that. Um, uh, yes. Today's conclusions. The sooner you act, the better. Because you might just have to do it once. That's my cheapest advice. Don't miss that chance. Handling addiction in the workplace is tricky, though. As always, in tricky situations, you will benefit from knowledge, skills, and strategy. Keep the model of change in the back of your mind when taking action. Remember to keep the strategy simple and differentiate the levels of action needed. And don't forget to practice not being liked. You will need it to stay firm and consistent and patient, because it might take a while getting the results you want. And don't forget, I would say, you might make a great change in somebody's life. Um, 
offering help, they might not like it or thank you at all. But at least you tried making things better for your em employee and for your company. And uh, in the long run, that's what counts. Thank you. Thank you. That was all. Yes. Uh, my name is Felix Bailing. I'm working at Avonova, which is an occupational medicine company. I am very glad to see that so many of my colleagues are here today. <laughs> it makes me a little less nervous. <laughs> um, uh, my chief and uh, two other nurses here. Uh, and some other colleagues. Yeah. Uh, I work for a company that's called Avanova. Uh, it provides uh, occupational health services throughout Sweden. We are present in 120 places. Um, and the place where I work is Skara, which is a small town. If you're familiar with the two big lakes in Sweden, the, it's Lake Vänern and Lake Vatten, it's right between. Um, yes. Uh, this is in Swedish. Um, I was a member of a national board that was led by uh, Ulrik Karmasson research at Karolinska Institutet who and we did this uh, national guidelines about how to treat um, uh, alcohol problems in the workplace 2016 uh, and right now I'm responsible for alcohol and drug rehabilitation in Avonova and issues that are related to that uh, including testing assessment treatment and rehabilitation. Uh, in s as we have heard before, uh, in Sweden we have uh, hard roles for the employers. Uh, I will touch on that later. And uh, I was invited to uh, by Anna Sjöström at ICAD to talk about how we work in occupational medicine. Uh, just because uh, there are so special conditions in Sweden. Uh, yes. Next uh, picture um, we have already talked about a little that um, uh, a lot of people with um, problematic uh, alcohol um, consumption uh, are present in the workplace, uh, and we have to the employers have to deal with them. And we believe that um, the earlier you can uh, help people, the less damage they get to their lives and their relations and their work. But it's so... Um, okay. So that in... Uh, this is also in Swedish, I apologize. Um, but uh, here we have uh, how we would like uh, how we would like to work with these problems we have in the left bottom of the flask uh, what we call early signals and it can be uh, problems that are addressed uh, in health service it can be um, the employer himself herself who seeks help and it can be the manager or boss who um, are worried about the situation in that case, uh, we would like to do a minor uh, screening and a minor treatment for those people. Then in the left flask, we have those who that where the company has waited seven years. <laughs> yeah. um, it has happened some, um, some bad things uh, driving uh, under influence of alcohol or other drugs or being drunk at work or something. And in the Swedish setting, uh, the employer have responsibility to address those problems. And uh, we provide uh, services for that. Um, with cooperation, with um, 
for example, nödde man skåren. And uh, uh, Anna asked me to talk about what the doctor do in this uh, at the occupational health center. And uh, the doctor do the diagnosis often to together uh, with the alcohol and drug counselor. Uh, we have to do a medical assessment of the patient about complications of drinking or drug use, about liver function and so on. And uh, rather often we give uh, medications that support the treatment such as antivirus or uh, acamprosat. And uh, we help with um, contacts with the employer and give them advice how to, um, to uh, follow up these patients. And um, during treatment uh, there are always testing, uh, so mon monitoring with drug tests and PET. <coughs> Uh, I will not. Uh, I will not explain this uh, picture in detail. Don't worry. But um, here we can see how it can work. Um, here is uh, where the patient comes to us. We do uh, initial screening, and then uh, they meet meet our doctor and uh, alcohol and drug counselor, and uh, we do an assessment, and uh, then we. Uh, have a meeting with the employer uh, and the union uh, and we have, have also continuous sampling at least once a month to monitor treatment. Uh, I have uh, picked up some cases to illustrate how this can be done. This first case is a woman. Um, 36 years old. She worked in a school as an assistant. Uh, her principal contacts our nurse because there have been concern about her alcohol habits. The concerns had come from colleagues and there had also been complaints from uh, parents about her having had bad temper against the children. And um, you can see that uh, the screening uh, suggested that there was uh, at least a risky uh, drinking, but uh, she don't, didn't have uh, dependence by definition. Uh, timeline follow back, uh, alcohol calendar, uh, 15 standard drinks uh, per week. Uh, I will tell you a li little about a method that uh, we, there is in Sweden, it's called Femto method, or 15 method. It's a combination of cognitive and behavior te therapy and uh, motivational interview. It's uh, adopted for uh, risky alcohol consumption in primary care and occupational medicine. Uh, it starts with evaluation, evaluation timeline follow back, audit, ECD, TIA, and so, 10 and so on. The goal for treatment uh, can be total alcohol abstinence or controlled drinking. Uh, when speaking of controlled drinking, it's very important that we have a clear uh, limits of alcohol per day and per week. And that you write them down. Um, and uh, the treatment itself uh, uh, is four sessions uh, to identifying trigger situations and uh, how to deal with them and uh, making plans of alternative behavior in those situations. 
Uh, during treatment, uh, we recommend that you monitor uh, drinking with alcohol calendar and PET samples. Uh, and after six months, there is a follow up. Uh, back to our 36 year old woman. She underwent the treatment. Uh, <coughs> she um, had a wish by herself to uh, have uh, controlled drinking. And then uh, we recommended, we are recommended that the goal should be three months of total alcohol abstinence and then that she could try to obtain controlled drinking with those uh, limits. Uh, not drink before a working day and just two drinking days per week. Uh, at follow up at six months, alcohol can only be at shows result in the limits. Uh, next case is a little more complicated. Um, it's a 50 years old male teacher. He works in a school for children with learning disabilities. Um, he has been uh, have several misconducts on, on work, and um, he had smelled alcohol at, at work. And in uh, at last, uh, the employer did a uh, breathalyzer test. Mm -hmm. You can see here, not very good. Uh, employer uh, gets mad, of course, um, and gives him notice of dismissal. I think it's called in English. Yeah. Okay. Um, the person calls for support from the union. The union claims that the person has a medical disorder, alcohol dependence, which is proved by a medical certificate from the GP. GP. And the current events uh, is considered to be a relapse, or several relapses, in the person's alcohol disorder. And there has not been a re rehabilitation for him. And the union says that uh, if you fire him, well, you get 32 months salaries in fine. Uh, and the law is like this in Sweden. Dismissal from work can only be done when all possibilities for rehabilitation and relocation have been tested and it's proved that the person cannot do any work of significance for the employer. So he underwent uh, assessment and uh, he, he was, uh, of course, dependent on alcohol. He had never psychological uh, problems and uh, we recommend 12-step uh, facilitation treatment and the goal, uh, total sobriety, of course, and PET tests every month. And he went in treatment for a year, uh, and uh, I don't think ev no one thought that she could recover, but he did in that year. So he came to all meetings, all cat samples were normal, well functioning at work. Uh, all is well, we thought, but uh, relapse in November 2016. Uh, starts in treatment group again and uh, until September 2017 uh, all PET samples again are normal and he will start in AA meetings. So uh, it takes time to recover. We heard that in the previous lecture. How is it that with our time here? Um. You uh, still have a uh, short 10 minutes, 8. Okay. Uh, are there any questions, by the way? No? Next case, uh, also male. Um, 
prolonged excessive alcohol consumption in periods, periods. Uh, recurrent atrial fibrillation, and it was a bad circuit when he felt the heart ticking. He got nervous and drank alcohol and he opened. <laughs> oh, bad medicine. Uh, he was admitted to a hospital because of chest pain and atrial fibrillation, <coughs> cardioverted and sent home with a lot of medications for the heart and uh, they uh, uh, gave him some um, benzodiazepines uh, because he, he was uh, very abstinent. Uh, then he comes he, he comes home and uh, what shall he do? He has been very afraid of his health situation. But uh, the doctor at the hospital said that, I'm sorry, it's not our business. Maybe you can go to the, the commune things, yeah. <laughs> um, oh. But he, he can't find any help. So he comes to our department and seeking help by himself. I think you know who it is. <laughs> uh, and uh, there we had audit 20, ICD 10, 5 or 6 criteria for dependence. Uh, and then he made the timeline for the back, like, looked like this. We had a rehabilitation meeting with the manager, client, and wife. And the client uh, patient was very clear that he would not like to go to a rehabilitation center or in a, in a more um, extensive treatment. Um, therefore, we tried this 15 method um, with a bit of reluctance from our side. Treatment starts, uh, ordinary way with control of PET before every call. Uh, he was given Camperol, a Camposat, with very good effect. And treatment good was total sobriety, of course. What did the patient claim the, the impact of Camperol was? Uh, loss of um, craving. Craving? Craving, yeah. Mm. So he had a lot of craving. Yeah even though he was sober. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And uh, the craving, he was a uh, lot of anxiety. Anxiety. Yeah, yeah. Follow, up, follow up after six months, the goal has been met. All the pet was normal. Um, the client fell well, feel well, and the wife happy and so on. <laughs> so I think it, he was very well motivated because the doctor said uh, you're going to die if you drink again. <laughs> so motivation is, is one key and sometimes it can uh, help with uh, minor, minor uh, treatments. I think. I think it's still working? No. Um, Yes, uh, was it was there is uh, some measures that uh, the occupational medicine and uh, the employee can use in the work against drug and alcohol problems. Uh, I don't know if it's the right term, alcohol up for the car. <laughs> yeah. Alcohol yeah. Alcohol okay. Uh, testing, uh, random testing is uh, increasing yeah. and the training uh, for uh, for manager and shifts is important and that the companies have good uh, policies and uh, what they uh, shall do when some thing is happens and education for uh, both employers and uh, the employees and uh, working with lifestyle service where they speak of alcohol problems like you speak of um, uh, diet and so 
And then we, of course, have this rehabilitation and treatment. Yes. Thank you for your uh, attention. <laughs> Thank you. Hi everyone. Hi. My name is Pieter Munk. Uh, I'm here in the role as a representative for the Swedish HR Association. I'm also uh, the CEO of the branch organization of occupational health services in Sweden. So therefore I'm quite familiar with what Fredrik was talking about. But today I'm here as an HR guy. The ordinary <laughs> HR guy in a major company. Uh, the Swedish HR Association, that's a, well, it's a quite large uh, association. About, well, it's in fact 8,000 active members. And it has as a purpose to support the HR community with knowledge and, and uh, net forms for networking and development. Uh, I will talk a bit about the Swedish labor market and what's happening on the labor market. Uh, what I see also about the future uh, that we have to take into account when we talk about these questions. Uh, and I will also have a la last uh, perspective of what I think the HR department role in this kind of work is. And I will begin to say that the, I think the major thing to for the HR department in any department is or company is to create the right period prerequisites for performance, that's a hard English word, mm -hmm. uh, but I think th that's the one thing the HR department should focus on, to create the right, right conditions for performance in the company. And that was quite easy in the 70s, when they had these large structures, large plants and large steel mills and stuff with large hierarchical systems then you could quite easily uh, get used to terms and have methods in like performance management and you have this uh, 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 you have this uh, talent pipelines and stuff it was quite easy all these HR systems are made for these large structures but we are in a large shift in the labor market. We're going for these large structures with where they will have a strong management with quite different working life. I used to ask, is there anyone who hasn't their job mail in their phone? <laughs> your job mail. Is there someone who has hasn't had their job mail in their phone? <laughs> Yes, one here. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, two, three. Well, th these guys are from the occupational health care service. <laughs> 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 they shouldn't have. But well, everyone else has. Yeah. And I think that is uh, that, that is quite a good symbol, because we have we don't have you know we don't have your work day and your private life. You have your private life in your workplace, and you have your work in your private life. And that is a shift that has happened in the last ten years or so. We also have these large structures. In Sweden, we have this uh, had a quite remarkable history of large structures, large, very large companies. But they, these aren't that large anymore. Spotify is one of the rising stars of the Swedish in the Swedish economy. They are about 200, 250 employees. Mm -hmm. You should have a huge value on, on the on the stock market, but they're not that many employed. And that also in terms when you talk about how long we are living. You said that the average guy would be about 80 years old. The Swedish pension system, as, now, as, as the pension system is most Western countries, are created for a quite different uh, age of the population. In Sweden we have the average age, age of 65 when we can go in pension. And when that was decided, then the average age of a person in Sweden was 65. Now it's 85 or 90. Uh, and in count to this also, we have a labor shortage in most Western countries, and indeed in Sweden. In Sweden, in the public sector, we are lacking about 250,000 persons. At the same time, we have about 200,000 persons on sick leave every day. So we have a mismatch here. And this tells me that we need to work longer, much longer, and we also have to secure that, that the fact that people can be on work, not home on sick leave. 
The traditional way to handle this was through this old system, occupational health and health and safety systems. It was created in the 50s, 60s, 70s. You were often, often taking focus on the physical level of health. And it was quite easy when you see on this. The systems in Sweden and most Western countries was made well. We had the difference when if you were injured at work, well, there was one system, the employer had some responsibility, and if you were hurt at home, then the society could take care of it. Could take care of it. And it was quite easy. If you lost your arm at work, well, then it was employers, and if you lost your arm at home, well, then it was society. <laughs> <laughs> but nowadays, when I talk to the physician, you, uh, with, with, uh, when a large problem in, 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 uh, in society is mental health disorders, you can't say where the origin is. Was it at work or was it home? Was it home or was it work? You can't say that. And we take into account also that we, don't, uh, we can't focus on the physical level of work environment. You also have to focus on more, some more things. We know all that we are a product of our, of our, our context, of the organization we are in, the social, the social context we are in on the workplace. That affects us, our health. But also the digital work environment. How does that affect our health? That means that we also have to take these three other things in account when we thinking about creating health in the workplace. But one thing that most employers don't think of is that in fact we have, you know, work create health and health create uh, performance of work. These two affects each other. So therefore, I think the next level is that you as an employer, in fact, should take into account people's individual lifestyles. If people stress too much on their free time, if they don't sleep, if they drink too much, if they don't exercise, if they eat wrong, well, then you don't have a well-performing person at work. <laughs> Regardless how good your digital system is, or your, how good your work groups are functioning, or that you have minimized risk in the work environment. So therefore, you have to take into account the individual lifestyle. And therefore, I think we should talk more about, instead of, of work-related health, more about work-affecting health. What kind of health is affecting your ability to work? What factors do we and me as an employee have to work with in order to have well-performing persons and staff on work? And in my ways, in my thinking, that that is both work-related things, but also things that are in person's private life. And therefore, uh, I think that the role of the Human Resources Department is quite crucial. Because in order to take this, this is quite hard, and isn't that is a culture shift in most companies. Mm -hmm. I should say that is one of the things, main things for the Human Resources Department. That is to uh, secure that corporate culture supports long-term performance and well-being. And if you think in your own companies, how, how many hours per week does the management team think about how we, how we create long-term performance and well-being among our staffs? <laughs> I think that's a crucial question, mm -hmm. because that's uh, my job department role, is, is to, to see that the management department, the management team thinks about that. But also that policies, processes and, and uh, systems exist and are implemented. And also, of course, that uh, the managers and the employees have the right knowledge and skills about this. That I, as an employee, understands the relation between my living habits and my performance. But also, how, as I am an employee, understands how my behavior at work affects everyone else's performance. But I, as an HR department, that all, must also secure that there is uh, support to find when something happens. You can't leave the manager and the employee alone when, it's, when there is a crisis or when someone needs help with the lifestyle factors. And that doesn't matter if you're talking about alcohol or, or food abuse or that you have a lack of sleeping or something, but you need to have help. And you need to have a professional partner there. And you also have to have a system that when people are ill, you have to have a false line back to work. 
we all know the effects of people uh, being home too, uh, too long time, uh, how hard it is to get them back to work. And if you an employer have a fast track when people are ill so that people can go back to work, then you earn a lot of money and also a lot of, uh, super a lot of stress. So, uh, and that is regardless of what country you are, I think. When I've been talking about people in, from people in Norway, Denmark, uh, Belgium and stuff, all agree about this. But still, we always tend to see that the person who has, if someone in risk, it's easy to settle. But I always think that if you can't, as I said to one of our uh, um, members of parliament, in fact, I was discussing this, I said the effective thing is to have people at work and do the investment before people get ill. She had some problem with that because she then said, well, uh, whose responsible is that? And so if you don't care about the responsibility, but that they have to do it. And then we found that in a long way. In Sweden, we have some help. We have this, uh, this legislation, as Fredrik was talking about. And my, uh, when talking to the labor unions and, and to the uh, other, uh, the, uh, the employer unions, I should say, and they say that the employer has to do all that is technically possible, uh, possibly and economically justifiable justifiable in order to get someone back to work. We have great help with that in Sweden. But regardless of that, I think the, the, the thing I've said before is true everywhere. So, and why? Because I think that is the question for today. What is required in order to create the successful companies and organizations of the future? If Sweden, if we in the Western world should be as, as successful as we are as today, we really have to think about that. Mm -hmm. And the management teams also have to think about that. And we were discussing a few of us, the artificial intelligence going into world, to going into to working life. Well, how does that affect the people who are working in the workplace? How do we make the most out of people's skills and performance in the future? So, uh, well, that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you.